Chris, how are you feeling now after um, winding up a 13-year career, career at Wilson Asset Management? How, how, how are you feeling right now? Yeah, fantastic. Mixed emotions. Obviously, it's a tremendous period at WAM. You know, for for 12 years, around a third of my life. Uh, so, it's, WAM's been a huge part of my life personally, uh, and, a, and a major part of my career, obviously. But certainly, um, you know, remaining involved on the boards. So, not completely out. But day to day, yeah, finished up more recently and I'm um, really looking forward to having a proper break, which is something I uh, haven't been able to do for a very long time. What were the um, catalysts in terms of you deciding to, to wrap it up when you're still young um, and obviously still really you know, passionate about in investing? Um, was it market related? Like, give us a sense of, of why. Uh, yeah, so I'm 37, James, and um, so still pretty young. Although they're good years, 37. They're, I remember those. They're years. good years, <laughs> and you know I certainly had a lot more hair when I started at Wham uh, than, than what I do now. So I'm hopeful I can grow a bit of hair back over the next period. <laughs> but um, no, look, it was certainly it's not a decision you make overnight. Um, you know, it's just been a privilege and an honour, in fact, to to work at Wham for 12 years and be a part of the success that we've had, growing the fund from 300 million to over 3 billion today, and, and to be able to recruit in particular a really high quality uh, team of individuals has, has, been, um, has been, and seeing them rise and come through the ranks over the years has certainly been very fulfilling. So there wasn't a specific catalyst, it was not related to the market at all uh, in terms of making the decision now, it was a very hard one to make and something I stewed over for quite a long time. Um, but the opportunity uh, to spend some time with the family, um, the kids are at a, at a great age now where um, you know, can spend some really quality time with them, so I'm very excited to be able to do that over the next period. Yeah. Do you remember the first stock that you bought for Wilson Asset Management? Not clearly, I don't, but one that does stick in my mind, which was one of the early stocks that we bought in, um, in 2009. So this was after the, the market had bottomed in March 09 and the GFC. And there was an incredible period to be in the market. That period from probably March 09 to September 09 was just a phenomenal period um, where you'd go out and most companies you'd see, you'd just buy them because um, there was so much value around. But the one stock that sticks in my mind was Credit Corp. Um, which I pitched to Matthew Kidman, who was the portfolio uh, manager at the time. The shares were trading at about 40 to 50 cents, and it was a bit of a, uh, a tough name for us at WAM. Back in 2000, early 2007, it was the biggest position in the WAM capital portfolio. And um, if you remember, they had a shocking profit downgrade um, back then, and in the stock actually halved in a day. So, um, so Credit Corp was some, a name that was still um, hard for us to digest internally. Had an emotional sort of attachment. It, and it to was, it. and it's, and we'll get to that. It's very hard to go back to those stocks that you've lost money on and been burnt on. But uh, pitched the stock to to Matthew. I think it was around that fifty cent level, and NTA was over two dollars. And um, we met with the the new CEO and the chairman at the time, Don McClay and Thomas Berge, who I rate as one of the best CEOs that I've ever met and one of the most underrated CEOs out there. Uh, and they were very impressive um, and had a really clear plan for the business and um, we ended up buying the shares uh, at around that 50 cent level and we have owned Credit Corp probably four or five times over the years from 50 cents to we got north of $20 at one point. Uh, so it's been one of our, um, uh, our successful investments um, over the time, over that time period and full credit to the, to the management team at Credit Corp and the success that they continue to have today. Yeah. You mentioned there that you started just before the GFC. Can you remember what it was like being in the market going into the GFC? Like what was, what were some of the things that were going on? One of the first things that Jeff and Matthew got me to do was, um, uh, if you remember back in 2006, Uranium was red hot. Um, and I remember clearly there were lots of IPOs, new companies that were floating um, with Uranium, you know, exploration Uranium companies. And one of the first things that Jeff and Matthew got me to do was to look at all these stocks and uh, and to ring these companies and pitch our wares that we we're a, a long-term investor and uh, and so I'd ring all these uranium companies because they'd all come on at 50 to 100 percent premium to their IPO price. So I just I clearly remember that period where uh, when I started at WAM that first year that mining space was just red hot and every IPO you just take it because you knew you're going to make 20 percent plus on day one yeah. uh, and particularly in that uranium space. So that was one of the first things that Jeff and Matthew got me to do was, was ring all these uranium companies and I wasn't very successful at it in terms of getting an allocation um, in these IPOs, the uranium ones in particular. But um, yeah, I just remember and clearly it was a good lesson for me looking back and reflecting was just how easy it was to make money at that point in time. And the market is a great humbler uh, and you know when times are good like that and it can't last and it, and it didn't last. Clearly uh, the market peaked in November of 2007 and we all know what happened after that. So you said leading into that, that it was really easy to make money. Um, we were chatting just before about how challenging the environment feels right now for, in, for investors and that 
it's hard for fund managers and, and investors, that the individuals that are watching this, to, to get a lot of conviction around stocks. It doesn't feel like it's super easy to make money out there right now. Is that a good thing for the year ahead, or what sort of give me a read on, on where we sit at the moment? I think it's never funds management managing money is is not easy, um, and it never is easy. And in fact, people say it's harder now than usual. I, I find it's always hard. There's always different battles you're fi you're fighting. There's always things that come out of left field that you can never predict. Whether it's geopolitical at the moment, with the uncertainty around Trump and, and what he does on Twitter and whatever he you know announces, and when you wake out of bed the next day. Um, or this general economic conditions. Um, it's, very, it's very, very hard. And so certainly, um, it's, I'd say it's harder than usual at the moment. Um, it feels like we are late cycle, um, particularly for the US market, which, uh, uh, as we know, uh, it's, uh, dramatically have been increasing interest rates there over the last couple of years. Um, but it, it is hard, and it's hard. the yeah, domestic economy is struggling. You've seen Sydney and Melbourne house prices um, have, come in, have come off 15%, probably a little bit more way to go there. Um, and the key for me is that interest rates have just failed to stimulate the economy uh, like they have had in previous cycles. We've got a record low cash rate at 1.5% and it just hasn't seen that flow on effect that we've seen in previous cycles with interest rates being so low. Um, so it's going to be, it looks as though it's going to be a tough year ahead uh, for the consumer, um, particularly with house prices falling off the flow and impacts that has on consumer confidence in the retail sector or the building materials sector. And to an extent, a lot of that's been priced in. You've seen companies like CSR, Harve, Adelaide Brighton's down 40% off its highs, borrowers come back. So a lot of that's come into to the share prices already and it's telling you that next year's gonna be tough. The share market normally moves six to nine months ahead of the economy. So the share market's telling you that domestic economic, economic conditions are gonna be hard next year. If we were to get a bit of a, a scale sort of discussion on, on going, um, give a sense of how you're feeling, in terms of if you had a clean slate to go and invest, um, would your sentiment right now on a scale of bearish at one end, bullish being a 10, where, where do you reckon you would sit? Where would you place your view if you had a clean slate and said, hey, this is the opportunity set, whereabouts on that, on that scale would you sit and why? Definitely closer to bearish. Um, you know, it does, as I said, it does feel like we are late cycle, in particular the US market. Um, we've really struggled here in Australia um, to, we haven't gone anywhere near the previous highs at 6,800 that we saw uh, in 2007. So it's been a long, tough cycle in the last 10 years where said interest rates have just failed to stimulate economic growth. But it does look like the economic growth will slow in the US next year, it will slow in Australia next year. So that paints a, a fairly tough backdrop, uh, I think, for the overall market. Generally, PE ratios are above their longer term averages um, across the market here in Australia particularly in the US. Um, you've got gearing levels are very, very high in the US, uh, you know, around four to five times for some companies that just borrow to, to buy back stock generally uh, over the last few years. But um, certainly in Australia, it's hard to get excited, I think, on a 12-month view. If you look forward now, um, you've got the housing market in Sydney and Melbourne slowing. You, you haven't seen the flow on effects from that yet on consumer confidence and the retail sector and just, just general discretionary spending. That will come through, I think, over the first six months of next year. Uh, we've got a state election in March here in New South Wales. We've got a federal election. We're going to have a new Prime Minister in May. Uh, Bill Shorten will be the next Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. um, and there's certainly a few of his policies like removing the imputation credits, um, abolishing negative gearing for homes, um, although grandfathered in existing homes, um, uh, certainly are going to put the handbrakes on our economy over the next 12 months. So you'd like to see a bit of the heat come out of the market first, in particular the technology sector. I think that's a space that's uh, quite ripe for consolidation, I think, from here. Um, particularly, I uh, saw an email the other day, um, stocks in the 100 PE club. Um, so I thought that was quite uh, significant in terms of where we are, where we are in the cycle. And, um, but it's been interesting, generally. You, normally, late cycle conditions are associated with um, higher interest rates and a lot of euphoria out there from investors. And we don't have that at the moment. It's quite the opposite. So that, that is a conundrum at the moment, trying to digest all those different factors. Yeah. Alrighty, we're going to go into a hypothetical world where you're setting up your own Chris Dot asset management, your own funds business. You've had obviously the experience and, and, and you've seen the success of the process at Wilson Asset Management. If you could run money your own way um, and you were starting from fresh, how would you do it? How would you set it up? And um, how would it be different to the way that you've run money for the first 13 years, for, for the last 13 years? Yeah, sure. So first thing to say is I haven't decided to do to set up my own shop yet. That's you know, completely off the table of no decisions have been made at all um, around that. I'm just looking forward to having, tuning out and have a proper break and deciding what's next at some point. 
Um, in terms of running money my own way, um, uh, I, I remember Matthew Kidman saying to me one day, one of their greatest fears when I joined WAM was had I been indoctrinated with the investment process at Challenger, been there for five years and seen how Challenger had gone about managing money and everybody has got their own way and their own style of managing money and everybody thinks it's the best and the, and, and the brightest and, um, and that's great. But uh, I remember Matthew saying to me um, just a few years ago that, that one of their greatest fears was would I buy into the way that WAM manages it, manage their money and, I, and I've, I've got a strong belief in, um, uh, in the WAM investment process. Um, that Jeff and Matthew have taught me over 12 years and um, it's been successful over 20 years so uh, through up and down markets so um, so that's the process that I've been indoctrinated in and, and, and what I've learnt um, and continue to learn. Um, it's the great thing about this job you're always learning. Um, the market's dynamic and it's a great humbler um, at various times but certainly um, one thing that we've bandied around over the years and um, is generally at WAM we hold high levels of cash um, WAM Capital's outperformed by 8% per annum over 20 years, holding 34% cash on average. So at various moments in time, we've talked talking to Jeff and Matthew over the years about, well, should we be more invested um, on average? Generally, share mar the markets go up um, and it's hard to hold high levels of cash because it can be a drag on your performance um, in markets that are, are rising very, very quickly in particular. So. So that one, that's something that we bandied around over the years, do we become more invested? But we'd always say when we had those discussions, geez, we must be getting near a top um, because there's an investment process there, it's worked, it's delivered over 20 years. If Why it ain't broke, don't about, fix it. Yeah. Um, and that was definitely a strong mentality that, we've, um, that we carried forward uh, when Matthew finished in 2010 or 2011 to today, to, to, to the current team that are in place there at the moment. Could you maybe give me a sense of, of what you think makes is a, is a good market-driven pick for the year ahead? Sure, I think one that stands out at the moment is Vocus Communications. So, um, the that, sec that sector's been really on the nose. Telco's struggled, as you know. Telstra has underperformed, TPG struggled, Vocus has struggled. But um, I think the beauty of these assets is they can grow no matter what the economy is doing. I and mean, the, the attraction with Vocus is we always like to, at WAM, we've always liked to find those stocks over the years that are unloved, under dis undiscovered, being thrown out by the market, have low institutional shareholder ownership in them. Um, but have got a really high quality um, asset base um, that generates high level of free cash flow. I think Vocus fits that criteria. Uh, where you've got a new CEO who's come in, um, essentially cleaning the business up. Essentially, if you look back, you could argue that Vocus has grown too quickly, um, acquired a lot of businesses over the years uh, and, and taken on a lot. Um, and so they're now entering a consolidation phase um, where they're gonna potentially uh, divest assets, um, clean up the balance sheet, get the debt down uh, and really look to continue the, to generate high levels of free cash flow. So that is a classic turnaround story, um, which I think has got huge potential to grow earnings over the next couple of years. And again, um, painting the backdrop for the economy over the next 12 months, I think that's a company that can grow no matter what the economy is presenting. Uh, and so certainly that's one that stands out on the market driven side, um, if you like. It's interesting because it seems like the telco industry itself is about the broader industry, not just focus, but it seems like competition is going to be really heating up there and it feels like their margins and are really going to be compressing. So you think focus still makes it through that sort of, that industry dynamic? Absolutely. And we've, I think a lot of that's getting priced into these companies at the moment. We know that a lot of these companies save for the transition from ADSL customers onto MBN. They make far less margin on that. So TPG are just digesting that at the moment. But Certainly the MBN hopefully will be rolled out in a couple of years time in full. Uh, but a lot of these companies have, have been planning for this for many, many years and it's not a, not a great surprise in terms of what's happening to their margins and their profitability in some cases. But um, the opportunity for some of these companies like a Vocus or a TPG um, to, to grow um, with that backdrop and, di and have that diverse asset base and, and high, you know, into different sectors, um, if you like, within that telco space. Uh, I think will hold them in good stead. So it feels like a lot of that pain has been felt um, in the sector at the moment. And certainly on a five to 10 year view, I think it looks quite attractive um, over that period. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, some of your best and worst calls. And um, if possible, you can give us a little insight into maybe a lesson or two that you picked up from, from those um, experiences. So why don't we start we can start with the good news. Can you talk us through some of you know your your best your best investments and and uh, and why you think it worked out? Sure. I mean, um, there's lots of bad ones, so it could be here all day. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, some of the good ones that stand out over the years, um, Smart Group buying those at the IPO and 
backing Devon in, um, and he continues to do a fantastic job. Dollar sixty IPO to north of um, of ten dollars today. Did get up over twelve at one point. Um, Blackmore's uh, was one that stands out as well. Um, A two Milk, uh, and also selling Slater and Gordon after they made the acquisition of Quindell was one that really stood out because um, that was a big position for us that we made some good money on over the years. Um, so that so that one stands out as well. But the one the, the probably the best that stands out for us as a team was Afterpay, um, initial buying buying the shares at the IPO. Uh, at a dollar only a few years ago uh, to where it hit $23 intraday uh, more, more recently. Um, and typically one lesson that uh, we've learnt over the years and um, I've been really um, consistent with is selling stocks way too early. Yeah. Uh, whether it be an Ainsworth Gaming or a Magellan, buying those early and selling them way too early and, and seeing them go on to be potential to be five, ten baggers where you've sold them and they've gone up two or three times for you. So that feels you feel sick when you see stocks like that. Um, being an early buyer of A2 milk at 50 cents, selling them at $2, watching it go to 12. Um, you, you feel sick watching that. So that's been a good lesson um, over how the years, you, is how selling you, too early. Yeah, how would, you, how would you start to improve your sell discipline so that you capture more of that upside? Have you, have you thought about how you would change that? Generally markets, as Jeff says, you, the share market, you go up in the escalator, you come down the lift. And I think that's spot on. And, and certainly some companies um, they do tend to overshoot and, and on the upside and on the downside in tougher markets. And so, so that's been a key lesson. I think that we learnt that well um, with Afterpay as a team where we bought the shares at the IPO. We ended up selling them about $6. Uh, and then Tobias uh, Yao, who, who works with us at WAM, um, said, no, look, I think we need to have another look at this when the insiders were selling down. At, I think it was $6.90. Um, I remember it clearly a few years ago. Uh, so luckily we bought back into the stock um, at that point and um, went on to sell it, I think an average price of $18. Um, so that, that's certainly been a good lesson for us in terms of understanding that the market can always go well beyond where you think it can go to the upside, but also to the downside as well. Um, so that was a key thing for us is um, to, to have that market feel um, and, and let the companies um, continue to flourish and, and understand that you can buy a company on a P10 you think it should trade on 15 or 16 times, but can easily go to 30 to 50 times in a, in a red hot market. And that's, or even beyond that. And that's certainly been the case with some of the things that we've owned over the years. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the painful lessons. <laughs> Where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yep, so the rules are, give us, give us a, a, you know, a, a trade that went wrong, an investment that went wrong, yep. and, and talk me through you know, sort of how you, how you use the lesson from that, that experience now sure. to, to improve your investing. So Austal Ships was one that stands out. Um, back in, I think it was 2015, we, we had it as a, a, a decent holding within the WAM Capital portfolio. We thought we'd better go over and meet the, the American management team over in Alabama, uh, Mobile. And so we, we ventured out, got on an airplane and went all the way to Alabama, which is an interesting part of the world. And um, uh, we met with the US team there and Walked away really impressed with the operations, what they were doing, as we know most of their profit these days is in the US for the US government. And uh, we met with the management team there and we were, we were very com comfortable. The stock was still relatively cheap in our eyes and we increased our position. After that, it was uh, in September, I think, uh, 2015, um, they just reported their result. We went to meet them and, and um, we were very confident in it. And we increased our holding after that visit to Alabama. Uh, and then I remember it clearly, they, had it, they put out a, a very large profit downgrade um, in early December. We were out at uh, Christmas lunch in early December and the news came through and the stock halved on the over the next month and uh, that was a very, very painful period. Uh, Austal was one of our biggest positions in the portfolio um, and so certainly that, that did hurt. Um, and I think you know, one, one clear lesson that we learned from that was um, uh, to cut your losses. Um, to, to, you know, things invariably when you're managing money will go wrong. Um, and I think one thing that we've, as a team, done fairly well over the years is being able to, to accept that we're wrong and move on and cut the position and move on to the next one. Because um, I said, invariably, a stock downgrades a second and third time. That happened in the case with Austal after that period. So um, unfortunately, it's very, very hard to do that, um, to, to, to cut a stock where you've lost half shareholders' money. Um, and it's, it's, it's very hard to digest, but that was a key lesson that we learned um, with that one. And the other one that stands out, which was one of my all-time favourite company visits, was a company called Australian Careers Network, um, which if you remember three or four years ago, the vet space was red hot, vocation, I like these companies, were all listed and, and going from strength to strength from a share price perspective. And 
I remember it clearly, um, Tobias again, our analyst and I went to visit the company Australian Careers Network in Melbourne. Uh, and we pulled up in the cab um, outside of their offices, which is a residential house. And I said to Tobias, I said, are you sure this is the right place? There's no signage up anywhere. And we thought, oh, this looks a bit strange. But sure enough, that was where they were based. And we walked in there and it was, it was a two-story house that had been decked out with offices, office space. So you had random desks in bedrooms and what have you. It was a very, very bizarre situation. We had a very small holding in that company at that time. Um, and I remember walking out and saying to Tobias, I said, oh gosh, this doesn't feel good. Um, uh, the company had gone from, uh, gone up two or threefold to that point and we'd missed it. Uh, and we'd bought a very small position and unfortunately we didn't sell it early enough and um, we held on to that position and a month after the company visit, the stock never traded again, disappeared um, after a, uh, a positive quarterly, in fact. So, um, and we all know what happened with vocation as well. So uh, that was one that really sticks in my mind. Uh, in terms of, I don't think I've ever seen a company before that's based in a residential <laughs> house. So yeah, that was a, a clear red flag in hindsight. Yeah. I mean, through this conversation, you've talked, you've mentioned a number of times around the quality of management. Mm. And some of the things that I pick up is that you like to back or follow good management teams around the place. You mentioned Thomas Beregi from Credit Corp is one of the best out there. What are some of the questions and the interrogation and the things, what are you looking for when you're trying to, you know, avoid a, a careers network sort of experience and, and what sort of things and do, do you go, go hunting for to try and understand whether you're backing good people? Sure, I mean, management is always, as a way, in the WAM investment process has been right up there in terms of it's a must in small caps and you, essentially we're privileged enough to manage money for shareholders and then we're passing that money on to the CEOs of the companies that we hold shares in to manage on our behalf. Uh, so some of the things that we look for over the years are, are people with a proven track record. You know, I think about the RCG uh, Corporation guys, which are now Accent Group, um, proven performers uh, in that retail space. Um, people like Jamie Ferros, Devon Smart Group, um, just to name a few, Michael Cade, Macmillan Shakespeare um, comes to mind as well. Proven operators um, with a good track record and, and looking to back them again um, in whatever they're doing. So that's been a, an integral part of the WAM investment process uh, over the years is backing good management. Um, I think it's critical. Um, and in fact, we've ruled out a number of companies that we haven't invested in because we haven't been comfortable uh, with management over the years. And um, so certainly having that credibility um, and, and they've, been there, they've been there before and, and, and got a proven history. Um, and some of the questions that we'll ask them, um, generally we're trying to learn more about the business and something that Jeff and Matthew have drummed into us as a team over the years is um, you can overcomplicate, overcomplicate investment decisions, I think. You can spend days, weeks on end in analysing one company going through the last 10 years annual reports. And, um, but essentially at the end of the day, trying to nut it down to what are those two or three key drivers of it that's going to move the share price over time and focusing the questioning on those two or three key drivers. And it can be anything from... Uh, um, you know, their acquisition strategy or, uh, or um, you know, different parts of the strategy um, you're really trying to, to unpick. Um, but generally we'd ask the companies the same questions over the years, over the years, and ask them the same things and look for consistency in responses. Any change in strategic direction we'd always get concerned about. The great story that Matthew Kimmon always talks about is the ABC learning story, uh, which we owned that when I started at WAM in 2006. And, Eddie Groves, who ran ABC Learning, would always used to say to Matthew, Matthew, the only thing you need to ask me is what the level of occupancy is in our centres. That is the key thing for our business. And so Matthew, every time he'd see Eddie, would ask him that question. And then one day he asked him, Eddie said, oh, you don't need to worry about it anymore. We're a very different business. We've got operations in the US, in Europe. We're, not, we're no longer just Australia. And that was, for Matthew, a, a red flag. And, and, and Matthew sold the stock on the back of that, bought it very successfully, successfully in, that, in that matter, over $7. So um, it's looking for the consistency in responses um, and, and getting, to know, getting to know the management really well and what makes them tick, um, what motivates them, um, and also trying to unpick their body language as well. In fact, that's one thing we've done over the years at WAM is we have getting body language training um, and try to read. It's, you know, say, non, every, all communication, 80% of it's nonverbal. Um, so whether they cross their arms or they got their hands behind their head, you can just pick up little things like that. Um, when you're discussing things with companies as well. So that, those are and the sort of things that stand out. did you find that work? Did that help? Oh, absolutely. A lot of the time it does. And, um, you know, a lot of, you get lied to in this game and it's the hardest thing is trying to work out when you're getting lied to. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've been able to pick that up sometimes over the years, more often than not. But uh, 
um, being able to read someone's body language and um, is uh, can certainly um, I think provides an edge uh, for people over time. Yeah, interesting. Um, all right, last question. Um, you we can cast your mind back or put yourself in a scenario where you're able to give yourself advice at the start of your 13 career at Wilson Asset Management, um, knowing what you know now. What would you say to yourself as you started your, your role there? Um, what advice would you give to yourself? Sure. Well, I think firstly, I, I think um, for all of us at WAM, you know, the business has grown dramatically and we never expected it to grow so quickly like it has. And it's been a tremendous um, privilege to be a part of it. And I think, you know, um, Jeff and Matthew, I'll, I'll just just really thoroughly enjoyed working with them and also the wider team at WAM has just been a fantastic period. And um, I think certainly um, looking back, it's, um, you, I haven't probably reflected enough um, at the time. You get caught in the day to day grind of, um, you know, you're like the, 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 the duck pedaling underwater. You're just constantly pedaling, pedaling, pedaling. And, um, you know, I think if you look back over time and, um, and you reflect, it's just been a tremendous period of growth to be involved in. Um, but certainly I think to, to um, on a more regular basis, reflect um, and, and take stock and, and, and take a step back and say, well, you know, ask your bigger picture questions. Why are we here? Why do we exist? Um, and what are we trying to achieve here? And um, um, I think that uh, uh, there's that as well as um, work-life balance, I think is critical as well. Um, I've been very guilty about, because you love the market so much, it's very hard to switch off. You, I've always seen working in the market as more of a hobby because um, you, you love it so much. You just love the market, the thrill of the chase. Um, Matthew always used to say to me, I've got white line fever. You, you walk over the white line crossing the sporting field and you're so competitive and you want to win. Um, so there's all those things that you, you throw into it as well, is, um, uh, is, is pacing yourself. Um, and uh, so certainly that's one thing that stands out um, over the years is, um, you know, you really need to have good breaks uh, and, um, and, and, and take, reflect on those breaks and then um, and go from there. So that's probably one thing that stands out for me. Appreciate you coming in, telling us a few stories. Congratulations and, uh, and, and uh, have a great um, break and we look forward to well hopefully hearing from you again but uh, it sounds like uh, no decisions made on that front just yet. No look and thanks for your kind words James and I really appreciate and uh, all the support that you've given me at Livewire and the success that you guys continue to have a business as a business and I look forward to watching that continue to flourish in the future.